Almost every time we talk about quantum field theory, which happens often on our channel, we encounter the concept of virtual particles. Every time I mention this term, I imagine the skeptical expressions on the faces of those who hear it. Indeed, we are accustomed to the word virtual indicating something imaginary, seeming, unreal, or non-existent in reality. However, in physics, virtual particles are used to explain a vast number of observable phenomena, things that do exist in reality. How can something imaginary affect reality? This seems paradoxical and incorrect, leading to suspicion that the whole concept of virtual particles might be flawed, or that virtual particles are just a crutch to describe something we don't yet understand. We most often encounter this concept on our channel when talking about electromagnetic interaction, specifically how this interaction occurs at the subatomic level within the framework of quantum electrodynamics, a subset of the more general quantum field theory. According to this theory, electromagnetic interaction is essentially the result of charged particles exchanging photons. The simplest way to explain this is with the example of repulsion between two equally charged particles, say two electrons. In quantum electrodynamics, the characteristic known as electric charge describes a particle's ability to emit and absorb photons. The greater the charge, the more actively the particle does this. Photons have momentum, and if a particle emits a photon with momentum directed, say, to the left, then by the law of conservation of momentum, the particle itself must acquire momentum directed to the right. Conversely, when this photon is absorbed by another particle, it will acquire momentum directed to the left, causing the particles to move in opposite directions, moving away from each other, just as if a repulsive force was acting between them. This result of exchanging photons between like-charged particles is what we perceive as electrostatic repulsion, according to Coulomb's law. My regular viewers have heard this explanation on my channel many times, and it is also common on other channels. However, any careful consideration of this illustration raises certain questions about this theory. For example, let's consider the behavior of a single charged particle that is not interacting with anything else. Obviously, it should also emit photons, which would carry away some energy and momentum. And this process should somehow affect the particle according to the same conservation laws. The momentum is still somewhat clear. If we assume the particle emits photons equally in all directions, the total momentum of the system will average out to zero over time. But with energy, this doesn't work. Energy is a scalar quantity, and the continuous emission of photons should be accompanied by an energy loss for the charged particle, which should manifest in some way, perhaps in the form of reduced mass or charge. Yet electrons, for example, neither change their mass nor charge while continuing to participate in electromagnetic interactions, emitting these photons without any apparent consequences for themselves, which seems strange. Moreover, photons are known to be quanta of the electromagnetic field, and the emission of photons should appear to an external observer as the emission of electromagnetic radiation. However, we know that stationary or uniformly moving charged particles do not emit electromagnetic radiation or at least we do not detect such radiation. Only accelerated charged particles emit radiation. We have discussed how and why this happens in a separate video. Thus, the theory of electromagnetic interaction as a result of photon exchange seems to contradict experimental observations. And in physics, experimental results are respected. This raises the question of why physicists believe in the emission of these photons if they cannot be detected. Lastly, in the comments under videos where I illustrate this concept, a common question arises. How can the same mechanism explain the attraction between two oppositely charged particles, like an electron and a positron? All these questions are valid, and the answer is that electrostatic attraction or repulsion is explained by the exchange of not ordinary, but virtual photons. Here, we need to explain how virtual photons and virtual particles differ from ordinary real particles, and how these differences allow them to do things impossible for real particles. To understand the difference between real and virtual particles, let's first consider a quantum mechanical system of real particles, 
such as a pair of negatively charged electrons and positively charged positrons held together by electric attraction and rotating around a common center of mass. This system known as positronium really exists. This system will of course have some energy consisting of several components, rest energy of the particles, their kinetic energy, and potential energy from their electrostatic attraction. The exact value of this energy is not our concern right now. What's important is that this energy exists and is a definite value. Moreover, if we isolate our positronium, preventing it from interacting with anything else, the law of conservation of energy allows us to assume that this energy will remain constant. Thus, once we measure the energy of this system and ensure it's free from external influences, we can expect it to maintain this energy indefinitely with any measurement yielding the same value. However, from the perspective of quantum mechanics, this is impossible as it contradicts one of its basic principles, the uncertainty principle, which forbids certain pairs of parameters of a quantum mechanical system from being precisely defined simultaneously. Most commonly, we encounter the uncertainty principle in the context of a quantum object's momentum and position. The more precisely the momentum is defined, the less certain its position is. If we could determine a particle's momentum exactly, its position would become completely uncertain and vice versa. The uncertainty principle also limits the precision of other parameters, such as a system's energy and the time during which it remains in a given energy state. Even the most accurate energy measuring device cannot determine the energy precisely unless the measurement lasts indefinitely long. In real measurements, due to the principle of relativity, we will always measure energy with some error. Our device will show slightly different values each time, with larger discrepancies over shorter measurement times. Thus, our system is closed, and nothing seems to change within it. However, the measured energy values will vary, experiencing small fluctuations within a certain range. These fluctuations are known as quantum fluctuations. And if earlier we concluded that the energy of the system must be conserved on the basis that the number of particles in our isolated system remains constant, then the fact that in reality, the system's energy fluctuates within quantum fluctuations can be interpreted as if the number of particles in it is changing. These particles, whose appearance and disappearance explain quantum fluctuations, are called virtual particles. Moreover, even if we consider a system without real particles, that is, simply put, a vacuum, the creation and annihilation of virtual particles will still occur. Quantum fluctuations will simply occur around the so-called zero-point energy of the vacuum, which, although called zero, apparently is not equal to zero, but has the lowest possible value. By the way, virtual particles responsible for the interaction of real particles are also emitted not by these particles themselves, but by the vacuum. Just due to the presence of particles, the vacuum begins to produce virtual particles somewhat differently than it did before they appeared. This phenomenon is also called vacuum polarization. The key difference between virtual and real particles is that the appearance or disappearance of virtual particles does not change the energy balance of the system, in the sense that we talk about this balance within the framework of the quantum uncertainty principle. This means that virtual particles do not have energy, or rather, they exist for too little time to measure their energy, again, within the uncertainty principle. And in quantum mechanics, if you cannot measure something, you can consider that it does not exist. For example, the energy and momentum of an ordinary real photon are related to the wavelength of the corresponding electromagnetic radiation, which we can measure in an experiment. For a virtual photon, the expression for momentum remains relevant, but the expression for energy does not work. The energy of a virtual photon is zero. This means that a stream of such photons has zero energy. So we cannot observe this stream by ordinary methods, which assume the exchange of this very energy with the detector. Simply put, we do not observe photons emitted by a charged particle within the framework of electromagnetic interaction because they are not ordinary, but virtual photons. Of course, not only photons can be virtual, but strictly speaking, any particles, including electrons and other more massive leptons, mesons, and so on. 
However, other usual conservation laws, such as the law of conservation of electric charge, must be observed. So charged virtual particles must be born in particle-antiparticle pairs. It is important to understand that both virtual and quite real charged particles can be born from the vacuum. This process is known as pair production. The difference is that real particle-antiparticle pairs are born in the presence of fields carrying significant energy. We have already observed this in strong electromagnetic fields and assume that the same is possible in gravitational and other fields. In this case, each act of pair production leads to a decrease in the field's energy, equal to the rest energy of the particles that have appeared. So the law of conservation of energy is preserved not only in the quantum mechanical, but also in the classical sense. The particles born this way have energy and therefore are real in all senses and can be detected. For this reason, these particles cannot disappear irrevocably as this would violate the law of conservation of energy. Although of course, they can annihilate either with each other or with other such particles or antiparticles. For virtual particles, this is not required. They appear and disappear without any additional reasons. However, if we talk about massive particles, unlike massless photons, we can no longer say that they do not have energy at all. After all, any body with mass already has energy, according to Einstein. This imposes even stricter conditions on the lifetime of virtual particles. They can exist only for a time determined by the uncertainty relation. Any interaction involving the exchange of such particles must occur within a characteristic time less than this time and over characteristic distances equal to this time divided by the speed of light. That is why electromagnetic interaction carried by massless photons occurs at any distance, while the strong nuclear interaction within the atomic nucleus, whose carrier is pions with a mass of about hundreds of millions of electron volts, acts over distances of about 10, 13 meters. This fact is often interpreted as virtual particles need some time to fly from one interacting particle to another. However, this is not entirely correct. According to the special theory of relativity, the speed of a particle is expressed through its momentum and kinetic energy by such a formula. For virtual particles, as we remember E equals zero, that is, we would get the speed of the particle equal to infinity. This result should not be taken literally. As in the vast majority of cases, when a physical formula gives us infinity, it means that we are doing something wrong. Most often, we have gone beyond the boundaries of the applicability of the model within which this formula was obtained. This is exactly the case here. For virtual particles, this formula does not work because for virtual particles, the concept of speed is generally weakly applicable. It can be said that virtual particles live too little to move in space over distances exceeding the uncertainty in determining their position. And therefore we can, in principle, consider them stationary. That is, they are absorbed essentially where they appear. Given this, it is not difficult to understand, for example, how exactly the exchange of virtual photons can look like the attraction between oppositely charged particles. Indeed, one should not think that virtual photons sort of fly out of the parent particle and fly in one direction or another, determined by their momentum. It is more correct to say that virtual photons appear in some region of space at a distance of one wavelength of the corresponding electromagnetic radiation from the parent particle, and their momentum at the appearance can have any direction. After an extremely short period of time, these particles are absorbed again, either by the particle that produced them or by another charged particle in the same region with a probability proportional to the charge of the particle. In the second case, the act of birth and then absorption of the particle will lead to the exchange of momentum between real particles, that is, their interaction with each other. Thus, virtual particles are a convenient tool that allows us to combine the law of conservation of energy with the uncertainty principle, as well as give both qualitative and quantitative descriptions of quantum interaction processes. However, the main question remains unanswered. Do these particles really exist or are they themselves a mathematical abstraction? Usually, we call really existing something that can be directly detected in experiments. And if we understand this term this way, then strictly speaking, really virtual particles do not exist 
because we cannot detect them by direct observation by definition. However, here arises no less complex philosophical question about what direct observation is and where the line between direct and not very direct observation lies. Because in fact, there are many physical phenomena in which virtual particles, remaining invisible, directly affect the course of certain physical processes. A classic and already well-studied experimental example of such processes is the Casimir effect, in which metal plates placed at a very short distance from each other begin to experience an attractive force inexplicable from the point of view of the laws of classical physics. The theory of virtual particles explains the Casimir effect as follows. Any photon, whether real or virtual, corresponds to an electromagnetic wave of a certain frequency. In the space between two plates, these waves can exist only in the form of standing waves, the length of which fits into the length of the gap between the plates an integer number of times, meaning that photons corresponding to these wavelengths can appear only in the space between the plates. Outside, photons corresponding to any wavelengths can appear. That is, fewer photons will be born between the plates than outside, meaning the pressure of virtual photons on the plates from the outside will be greater than from the inside, which explains the presence of attraction. Thus, the virtual photons themselves remain invisible, and we can say that they seem not to exist. However, there is an effect from their appearance, and it is observable. Can we equate the observation of the manifestation of particles with the existence of the particles themselves? Physicists still argue about this. In fact, the question of whether virtual particles really exist boils down to a dispute about what really means. And this is more of a question for philosophy than for physics. For us now, it is important that the theory of virtual particles allows us to qualitatively explain and quantitatively describe practically all observed processes in the universe, as well as make good predictions about things we have not yet observed but plan to observe in the future. And as long as the virtual particle model works, physicists don't even care much about the extent to which they can be considered real particles. We will also repeatedly use the concept of virtual particles to explain various physical phenomena in our upcoming videos. For now, that's all from me. Goodbye, dear friends, and see you next time.